In this episode of Hot Hardware's Two and a Half Geeks, we have Apple accused of throttling things, an alien threadripper, Alexa, and other AI devices. Are they spying on you? And a whole lot more giveaway, too. We're back. Welcome back to another episode of Hot Hardware's Two and a Half Geeks, where three of us are here, one of us maybe in half mind and spirit, but <laughs> partially geeked. I'm Dave Altavilla, and uh, I'll be your host for a little bit with uh, my two rather tech intelligent partners, Marco Cipetta and Paul Lilly. Gentlemen, it's good to be back on the interwebs with y'all. How you doing? Yeah, I'm doing okay. It's been a hell of a week, but I survived, so I'm not going to complain. <laughs> yeah, Paul, you're surviving out there in uh, Tennessee where it's a heck of a lot warmer than up here, damn it. I am. There's no snow outside, so I'm in good shape down here. I woke up to deep single digits this morning. I think it was like, no lie, two, two whole degrees. And I'm not thrilled <laughs> about that, Paul. <laughs> and I'm going to the Patriots. I'm going to the Patriots on Sunday, and uh, it's going to be like 12. It'll be balmy by then. <laughs> <laughs> oh, brutal, brutal, brutal. But we won't whine too much about the weather. We are gearing up in a big way, however, for a heck of a lot of work in the uh, coming week for CES 2018, the big buildup, lots of stuff going on, um, lots of manufacturers gearing up to trot out their best wares for the show and Viva Las Vegas. What are you guys, let's let's start real quick. What are you guys expecting to see at the show? What are you hoping for at the show this year, maybe, that uh, was missing from, from CES gone by? Any yeah, ideas I'm hoping, there? I'm hoping that taxis are available and I don't miss any meetings. It's If you've never been to CES, it is the most insane grind trying to bounce from hotel to hotel to hotel to convention center. It's absolutely insane. If I get to see some cool tech and I don't miss any meetings, I'll be happy. Yeah, man, absolutely. I can I can totally relate to that grind. Done it. I'm actually staying back this year. I'm going to man the fort with Paul. Uh, Paul, have you been to CES before to, to see the nut house that is Las Vegas with 150,000 people converged on it? I have a few times. It's been a, a long time since I've been, but I have and experienced it. And it it's uh, uh, it's fun and it's it's an experience. We'll put it that way. But I expect yeah. this year we'll probably see a lot of uh, AR stuff, I think. Cause it seems like we, we usually have a theme every year, and I think that will be one of them this year. AR and VR guaranteed to be big for sure. And yes, Sensory Overload, which is the city of Las Vegas, actually. So it's fitting to have that show, and it's, it is a good time. It's, uh, it's a lot of work and a lot of fun, all wrapped into one week of tech goodness. So we'll take it every day of the week. Let's... Uh, Let's dive in right now to uh, the headlines and the, um, the the features we've covered at Hot Hardware this week, and uh, talk about some of the, the big the big breaking uh, items that are burning and perhaps your your geek minds out there. Um, we are uh, we're we're now getting wind uh, of of new rumors and and gyrations in the Apple saga. Apple throttling iPhones to theoretically preserve the con uh, consumer experience, um, sacrificing um, performance for battery life. And if you think about that initial um, you know, premise uh, you know, on, on, on a very surface level, perhaps that's not such a bad idea. You know, as a phone gets older, uh, gracefully bleed off a little bit of performance in an effort to preserve battery life because battery life tends to be more important for most mainstream folks, obviously, if the phone's up and working, it's a lot easier if it's dead without a battery. So so that sort of has some logic behind it. But I think there's a couple of issues here. And, and Apple is even dealing with um, all kinds of legal issues. Um, it's getting even more intense today. We heard of um, uh, France. Uh, there's a group in France that's actually uh, trying to levy criminal charges against them for this, which sounds a little outlandish, perhaps. But um, there's there's multiple issues that here. One of them is transparency. Marco, why don't you take us through the ins and outs of this saga as the as the Apple turns, so to speak? <laughs> so sure. So over the years, it, basically with every new iPhone release, there's always you know murmurs or complaints that 
oh, Apple's slowing down my old phone with the latest iOS updates, and it kind of forces me to upgrade. Um, so this isn't exactly that. This doesn't like spread across every iPhone. But what Apple has admitted, and they're touting as a feature, um, which is available for iPhone 6, and it's coming to the iPhone 7 with iOS 11.2, um, or it actually came out with iOS 11.2. What Apple is saying is that as the lithium ion batteries in the iPhones get older, their ability to supply peak current or maintain a full charge is diminished. And if they cannot maintain peak current output, a device may shut down. And because that mars the user experience, Apple is throttling the performance of the phones so that they have less current draw, which in essence slows down the phone. So. Apple is using the battery as the excuse for throttling the performance of the iPhone. No one else does this, so it means one of two things. Apple has under-engineered the battery and it can't supply the necessary current as it ages. Now, if it's coming to the iPhone 7, they're hardly old enough where the batteries can't supply peak current. Right. Or they're full of it and it's planned obsolescence just to make your phone feel slower. I don't know what side I fall on here. Um, if other people were doing it, or maybe other people are doing it and the news hasn't surfaced. So let me let me preface with that. It seems kind of shady to me. It doesn't seem necessary. Um, maybe in if my gut is telling me Apple uncovered a problem and this is to hide the unexpected shutdowns people were seeing, which they haven't correlated to their battery yet. So that's mm. my take. So this is a this is an iOS 11 um, feature. So when you you have an older device and Apple rolls out an update and everybody gets iOS 11, um, the older devices theoretically are are throttled with you know the ones with aging batteries. That was the logic that Apple gave, right? So you know what I guess what's what's interesting here and 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 what bothers me the most about this, Marco. And, and you're right. I don't know which side I fall on this. I think it could be a lot of things. Um, it, it could be a little of both, right? I mean, it could be a little bit of planned obsolescence and it could be a little bit of, you know, preserving user experience for some users, especially some of the newer iPhones that felt the slowdown. Um, so, but I think what's paramount here and what makes this feel, as you said, use the word shady, what makes this feel shady is the lack of transparency, is, is the lack of notification. If Apple only came out and said, we're doing this, just letting you know. You know that the, in a perfect world, they'd give a little checkbox with a, you know an option to enable or disable this feature, um, because you know some people might say, yeah, I'll I'll bleed off a little performance for for battery life. My phone still feels pretty dang snappy, so let's see what this feels like. They might opt for that, or they would say, no, I I want all that performance. Battery life be damned, and so it, so the lack of transparency is what really gives it that that spin you know feels disingenuine and uh, it's tough it's tough to come up and you know have the user base discover that and then reason it away properly without it feeling a little shady somehow somewhere because it, it you know there's just doesn't feel right paul what what are your thoughts on this you're an you're an iphone user actually so have you experienced this for yourself and and what do you think about what apple's doing here yeah, I have the uh, 6S Plus. I bought that the day it came out and I've been using it ever since. And I haven't run into any uh, slowdowns that I've noticed. Um, after the story broke, I did go to Geekbench and, and rerun some benchmarks, and they still seem to be where they're supposed to be. So I don't know if you know maybe my battery hasn't degraded to the point where this kicks in. Um, I think it's, it's a, a little weird on Apple's part. Uh, for what you said, there, there should have been some transparency if they're doing this, or at least give users the options in uh, settings if they want to use this feature. It's a feature, not a bug. Um, <laughs> the thing is, I don't remember people, maybe they were and I just didn't see it, but I don't remember people complaining before that their phones were turning off uh, as their batteries got older uh, for whatever problem they're trying to fix, supposedly. So I don't know that that's really a, a valid excuse of why they're doing this. Um, on the flip side, like I said, I, I've been with iPhone for the past few generations and haven't noticed a slowdown over time. So it's it's hard to tell what's really going on. I think there's 
there's more to it than what Apple's saying, but probably less to it than the conspiracy theories. It's probably the explanation is probably somewhere in between. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, I have, I actually have friends and family that have iPhones that have expressed th that exact sentiment. They've said, Dave, do you know anything about the, the iOS 11 or the latest iOS update? I've heard that before. I remember having conversations and, you know, I get all I peppered as the, the, the tech geek in the family. I get peppered with all kinds of tech support questions. And that's been one of them. You know, my iPhones got really slow all of a sudden. And they just rolled out this patch. I want to, you know, this iOS update. Um, I want to, I feel like I want to roll back because of it, because everything just slowed down. Now, I don't know if that's, hey, you know, you, you got another update and it pushed a little bit more storage capacity in an already taxed phone that's filled up with pictures and video that they've, that they've got on there. And, you know, there's bit rot going on. Um, God knows Android certainly has its share of bit rot. Uh, we've, we've talked about that here. Um, but yeah, they were sort of caught with their hand in the cookie jar. Somebody measured the before and afters with empirical data and they had, they came right out and acknowledged that's what they're doing. So it's, it's tough. Uh, Marco, is there a way to recover from this and save face for Apple? Apple doesn't have to do anything. Um, they're, they're honestly, th this is, is crappy news. There'll, there'll be some class action lawsuits and no matter how it plays out, um, the Apple loyalists will be like, oh, they were just protecting our batteries. This is, it's not a big deal. Everybody's phone slows down over time. And the Apple haters that are gonna bash Apple no matter what are gonna use it as fuel and the status quo will be maintained. <laughs> <laughs> wow <laughs> at least at least that's my take <laughs> <laughs> well that yeah that, that's probably it in a nutshell i think uh i think what's what's going to be interesting to watch are the class action lawsuits i mean and, and there's even like i said there's even a a criminal lawsuit being filed now by a group in france i'd have to find that headline for you john but um it is it it is actually a a an illegal act to specifically um hamper a device's performance or any product's performance there you go john good good man uh to to hamper a device's performance uh in an effort to um scroll down a little bit john if we can get on that um to you know drive planned planned obsolescence planned obsolescence in france is illegal sort of bottom line it and that is um that is something that is just amazing to think of that you know over there they may they may be you know trying to you know run up some some apple execs in, in a criminal charge uh for this effort but it it is something that folks are passionate about i think folks are right to be outraged a little bit at the lack of transparency i think that's what's what's key here um but you're right, Marco. Apple Apple's probably not going to react a whole lot more, except for you know the statement that they came out with. I think it also shows a little bit of a disconnect for Apple from its user base that perhaps it hasn't experienced in the past. Maybe they've gotten a little bit too big for their britches. I mean, Apple's very successful, obviously, you know, in in multiple devices from from iPhones to to, to Mac, you know, laptops and, and desktops, and you know, th that's really a, a big sort of, like I said, disingenuous step to, to not inform your user base. You're doing something deliberate like this and think that's okay to, to just, oh, you know, this is what we do here. And in the in, in your best interest, we, we deemed it okay to slow your device down. I mean, that's Yeah, I mean, this, this was rough. actually could have easily been avoided um, if it was positioned as, hey, if you have an older iPhone and the battery isn't quite holding up like it used to, we're rolling out this feature that will allow you to, um, we're rolling out this feature that will reduce the current draw of the SOC and it may stabilize the phone. And then people would try it and go, oh, hey, my phone doesn't reboot anymore and there's no news. Um, but instead it was snuck out last year on the iPhone 6 line. And you know they basically announced that it's coming to the iPhone 7. So it's basically been a year where no one really had official confirmation of this. So yeah, we'll see how it plays out. Yeah. 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 You know, images, everything. And if it looks bad, it, it generally isn't great. You know, <laughs> that's all there is to it. And so this is just one situation where Apple stepped in it again. They've had a little flurry of that lately and um, can't seem to, can't seem to stop doing that this year. Hopefully 2018 is better for Apple. We, we enjoy the healthy competition, certainly in the marketplace, and Apple brings some great premium products to the market. 
So uh, hopefully they can react and, and do the right thing here to to sort of uh, rebuild some some brand equity on this topic. But interesting stuff. Let's uh, let's move on. We'll keep a we'll keep a crisp clip here and uh, talk about some more things on the high end of performance. Uh, I recently got um, some serious quality time over the last month or so with the Alienware Area Fifty One gaming desktop PC. It is based on AMD's new Ryzen Threadripper sixteen core processor, sixteen core, thirty two thread, beast of a machine, copious cores and performance, as I noted in the. Uh, in the review, um, this is uh, a machine that's been out, uh, I should say chassis and platform uh, with Dell and the Alienware team, the gaming division of Dell for, for years now. But um, they just uh, came to market with the Threadripper, AMD Threadripper version of the machine. They were actually um, one, the only OEM at the time to be shipping a fully configured 16 core 32 Threadripper variant uh, when it came out uh, a month ago, and the machine is just dialed for sound. It is absolutely a beastly gaming desktop um, from compute performance to the GeForce GTX 1080 Ti GPU that's on board, um, which offers great gaming performance. Um, you know, it's it's it has we had our configured with uh, 32 gigs of RAM, the GeForce GTX 1080 Ti, a 256 gig M2 PCI Express NVMe SSD, and a two terabyte 7200 RPM hard drive. So, a combination of Threadripper and and all that gaming and and supportive hardware goodness, uh, a 1500 watt Gold Series power supply. You can imagine, it just absolutely as as the uh you know fitting for the for its cpu name just shreds <laughs> through everything rips through everything as only a thread ripper would um but what's what's great about the machine for me what i liked about it the most and you know it's it's not a perfect machine it's definitely a high-end premium config it's a pre-built if you're a diy guy you might look at the um you might look at the price tag and say wow it's that's expensive but i would challenge you um in, in a pre-built to, to, to come up with a case design, layout, serviceability, and, and toolless modularity about, about the machine that, that, that Dell and the Alienware team has engineered here. It's very well built. It's very easy to get inside. I don't know if you can show a, a side view of that, John, um, where, where I have the panel off and you can see the internals. Everything about it is toolless from the snaps that hold the, the the GTX 1080 Ti, the graphics cards that I had in there, as you can see, you can do up to three cards and multiple GPU SLI if you would like. Um, <clears throat> that the, the retention brackets for the graphics cards are, are all toolless, you know, press fit. The rear of them, as you can see, there's a card cage back there, snaps in to the, to the rear of the GPUs, holds them in real good. Self-contained water cooler uh, is a, uh, an AIO variant with a thick, dense radiator that does a better job than you might think for its its size it's but it's really thick and dense so it actually does a real good job of keeping Threadripper cool and just a just a well-built um well um designed machine from a thermal uh perspective as well pulling cool air in the front exhausting out the back in that upward fashion in what alienware calls its triad chassis design so well-built beautiful machine i enjoyed it um i think it's uh, an example of you know, good gaming, you know, engineering and a pre-built PC that, you know, you look at the custom boutique guys that, you know, use off the shelf or semi-tweaked uh, standard cases. This is a full up, you know, custom engineered design by Alienware and Dell. And I, and I really, I really enjoyed it. I think it's a great machine. I don't know if you guys got a chance to take a look at these, if you've seen them in person, uh, Marco, Paul, um, but what your thoughts are on this, on this beast. Go ahead, Paul. I'll defer to you first. Well, first of all, you're you're from the Boston area, so it's Thread Ripper, not Thread Ripper. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, Thread Ripper. <laughs> yeah, get it, get it right, Thread Dave. Ripper. <laughs> but yeah, this is this is uh, one of the more interesting designs. I think it's definitely um, an eye catch or something you want to show off, but it, it's it's not. It's I won't say um, 100% gimmicky. It's it has a function to it as far as the cooling goes, and it looks like. There's uh, some elbow room in there if you want to perform some upgrades on your own looking at, at the pictures you took. So it's an interesting design. And, of course, it's as configured. It's uh, really fast. So, Yeah. Yeah, Marco. 
Oh, beautiful machine. You know, I, I love the Area 51 chassis. Um, I really dig the Threadripper CPUs. I'm actually going to build myself a rig. Um, I'm going to switch to a Threadripper for myself. My, my personal rig now, I haven't upgraded since Ivy Bridge, and it's time. I finally have all the parts uh, here in, in the lab, and I'm going to build something up. Hope maybe over this weekend, we'll see how it goes. I had some stuff land in my lap today that I want to jump on. So no personal rig for me this weekend. Um, but yeah, I, I really dig the Alienware machine. Nice machine. Love the processor. You know, super powerful beast. Um, I mean, what more could you say? Yeah, yeah. You know, it's interesting. The um, I also got some peripherals with the with the machine as well. And, and Dell has come out with some new Alienware based um, peripherals to, to go with their machine. So uh, you've got uh, a pro gaming keyboard and an elite mouse. Um, and these are actually also pretty well built. I mean, I think there's some, you know, Marco, you're a keyboard aficionado. And so um, these might not have the, the cherry browns, but they're mechanical uh, key switches. And, you know, the, the deck feels solid, pre, um, really well built and sort of uh, build quality and, and um, um, some nice features too. You've got a volume roller on the top above the numpad area for um, for volume on your uh, on your system, and um, some other nice features too. So of, of course, um, Alienware lighting bling throughout, coordinated with the system. You can actually coordinate that so that all your not only the system lighting but your peripherals are lit up the same. Um, and so it's a, it's a really nice package. You mentioned performance, and that's an interesting topic. We'll we'll touch on real quick. Um, Actually, uh, Blackhawk, I'm going to answer a question from the chat. Blackhawk asks, what does Alienware's bloatware look like? Well, I would say that there's almost zero bloatware. Uh, the only extra software that's packaged on the machine are Alien Effects and the Alien Control Center for the peripherals. Um, and that's really all they include. So you do get the you know configuration software for the for the system lighting as well as things like um health monitoring and you know tweaking fan speeds and profiles for games that can be customized to adjust lighting and, and system setup for your games specifically which is really nice as well as the peripherals um in in the future and we've seen this and dell's going to be coming out with some interesting stuff in the software area and, and at ces we'll leave that there for now but there's going to be an evolution on the software side as well. But other than that, <clears throat> on this machine, that's it. Um, so it's it's actually you know built for gamers, you know by gamers, and it's you know as a result free of of crapware. <laughs> so that's that's good stuff. Get back to performance here after answering that question. Um, so what's interesting about Threadripper, Marco, and what I Threadripper, excuse me, what I wanted to uh, <laughs> to ask you is what what are your thoughts about you know we we stepped through the performance numbers and one of the one of the configs we ran this machine at was a 1080p config on the uh, Alienware monitor that we had, fast 240 hertz monitor. So we ran some 1080 numbers. Threadripper there bleeds off a little bit of top end performance, uh, you know, with a high end GPU at 1080p. Um, dial it up to 4K and the machines, every bit is fast. And then certainly in content creation and other heavily threaded CPU workloads, Threadripper kicks butt. Um, what are your What are your thoughts about that that bleed off at the low end for gamers? Uh, you know, maybe 1080 and even occasionally 1440p. Well, it's it's actually all resolutions. It's just you're shifting the bottleneck to the GPUs as the resolution goes up. So the the bottom line is um, there's two issues with Threadripper that Intel doesn't have to contend with that affect its you know just flat out throughput for gaming. Um, one is single core performance isn't quite as high as as Intel. So single threaded stuff um, is just not quite as fast. Period. That's just how it's going to be. You also have um, memory controllers shared across the two active die. It's not a single unified memory controller um, in, you know, just on a single processor. So that's going to cause some issues with some games. And then there's also, you know, as threads bounce from core to core, if you have a thread bounce from, from one die to the other, there's additional latency there as well. And that could pull performance down. Now, is it fast enough? Yeah, I mean, it's still super fast. It's just yeah. not flat out as fast you know, as a, a top end Intel CPU in single or lightning threaded stuff like games and, you know, some other apps. But if you're going to whack all of those cores, um, it's an absolute monster. And it's just one other interesting thing on performance is Dave's numbers 
he's he has some numbers stock that were almost as high as my overclock scores, which just yeah. goes to show that as Red Ripper has matured over these last few months, um, it's gotten better. And I think that's going to continue to happen. So even the performance of this machine today, it's probably going to be better if you bought it in a couple of months. So I, I just, I, I like the platform. I like what AMD did. I like that dog came out with something powerful as they did in sort of stealth mode. So yeah, it's not quite as fast with every workload, but it's still amazingly fast. And it's it's a good, dare I say, for a high-end chip, it's a good value in light of competing processors. Right, right. Yeah, no, I totally agree. Um, and and you make a good point about, about the improvements in performance over time. Um, I started with this machine well uh, before the uh, Windows 10 Creators update. Before I ran my numbers, just before I ran my numbers, I, I made sure the machine was updated to the latest creators update, made sure, you know, any of the AMD software on there was tweaked up to the latest and just dialed everything up as much as I could to make sure it was fresh. And it did. It made it made some tangible, you know, gains in certain areas. So yes, AMD is still working on uh, on getting Threadripper optimized in Windows. And uh, certainly the folks at uh, Dell and Alienware have crafted what I feel is a great great gaming desktop with a whole lot of room for uh, flexibility and, and upgrades and, and reconfiguration down the road. You can get in there, you can get right at the M2 SSD. You've got that toolless design for the graphics cards, memory. Um, everything about it is just really serviceable, really easy to get at. And you would think in that triad chassis design, perhaps it might be a little tight in there, but it's not. It's engineered really well. And um, I think a good machine, certainly for uh, for those looking for a pre-built with uh, a little extra special something, the Threadripper, Alienware Area 51 Threadripper Edition. Cool. Well, let's, uh, let's move on and uh, talk about something also in the news that's interesting and uh, perhaps a little bit controversial, depending on if you're from the tinfoil hat brigade or not. Paul, you <laughs> wrote up a little story called, Are AI Voice Assistants Just Corporate Spying Devices? Paul, tell us, are they? <laughs> uh, well, I'm, I'm going to leave that to the readers decide on their own. But yeah, the smart speaker market is growing pretty fast. I mean, Amazon kicked it off with their Echo products, and it's just kind of ballooned from there. I think this past holiday season, their Echo Dot was actually their top selling product out of everything, which Echo Dot plugs into your own speaker system, and then you have access to the Alexa AI assistant. So you can say, hey, Alexa, order me a pizza or you know whatever you're going to use the digital assistant for. Um, so we brought attention to an article at Gizmodo where they basically said, don't buy a smart speaker for yourself. Don't buy it for your family member. Don't buy an Echo. Don't buy a Google Home. Don't buy them, period. Uh, their bottom line was that these devices, and to quote them, are effectively paying money to let a huge comp tech company surveil you. Um, obviously, Amazon and Google, Microsoft, and the others that have smart speakers have a different take on this. They don't build these things uh, as surveillance devices. Uh, what they're getting at, though, is the way these things work is that they're always listening. They're listening for a wake phrase or a wake word before they jump into action. And they actually record and save a little bit of that information. Like when you say, uh, hey, Alexa, they'll record, I think it's a second and a half prior to that. Um, and that gets saved on their servers. And that's actually came in. Um, it was an issue, I think it was earlier this year or last year where there was uh, an individual that was a suspect in a murder case, and he happened to own uh, a smart speaker, uh, one of Amazon's smart speakers, and the police wanted Amazon to hand over that voice data to see if he incriminated himself. And initially, Amazon resisted, and before it actually became a big issue as far as going through the courts to see if they'd have to hand over that data, uh, the individual gave permission because he, he didn't feel it would have anything incriminating on there anyway. So that never came to being. But that is something we might see at some point. Um, the other thing is there's a concern that if these devices are hacked, somebody could be listening in in your conversations, not just uh, when you're talking to the speaker, but just because it's always listening for the wake phrase or wake word um, or whatever. So there's that. In the American Civil Liberties Union, uh, actually agreed with this. I want to read a quote that they put out in, in a blog post, one of their writers. that said, overall, digital assistants and other IoT devices create a triple threat to privacy. 
from government, corporations, and hackers. It is a significant thing to allow a live microphone in your private space, just as it is to allow them in our public spaces. Once the hardware is in place and receiving electricity and connected to the internet, then you're reduced to placing your trust in the hands of two things that are unfortunately are less than reliable these days. One, software, and two, policy. So that's the, uh, I guess you call that the tinfoil argument against having a smart speaker, even though they're as popular as they are. Um, and then there's one other thing. It's not just the concern that the companies will abuse us or that you'll be hacked, it's but that they, if there's a bug where something unintentional is happening, where we saw this with the Google Home Mini recently, where the touch sensor was wigging out, so it was constantly recording instead of just waiting for the wake phrase or wake word. Uh, Google did patch this with the bug, but for until it got um, uh, caught by a user, and Google was alerted to it. That's what it was doing for some users, the ones that had affected devices. So there's the concern there that by having these in our homes, we're giving up too much privacy, and there's there's too much downside versus the upside, which is uh, you can use these for a plethora of different things now, not just looking up information on the web or having it or telling the speaker to play a playlist. You can connect it to your smart home products and have it turn on your lights, lock your doors, or, and like I said earlier, even order a pizza these days. I mean, they're, they're pretty functional. So that is something that I don't think it's, it, it's a big issue, as big an issue as Gizmodo and, and, and some are making it out to be, but it is something that consumers will need to think about how much privacy they're willing to give up for this kind of functionality. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's an interesting topic to ponder and to, to kick about because there's a line to walk here and um, contextually aware computing is the future. Um, and, and that's what this is. This is a device that is aware of its environment. Uh, it's aware of your wishes, your thoughts, and, and, you know, hopefully can help service your wishes and thoughts as a as a result of that and so that's all goodness it's 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 really the the next wave of computing you know sort of environmental computing that that's that's aware of its environment and but you know make no mistake there are big corporations behind these devices and it's funny you you look at amazon and they are the king of metadata and that's what this is all about right they want to profile your your interaction with that speaker. They want to profile your interaction with their devices so that they can better target you for the services that they offer, whether it be buying something on Amazon, whether it be, you know, I don't know, playlists or an audible book or whatever, whatever it is your heart desires that they can service. The more they know about you and, and your needs and, and, and your, your daily life and, and how you might interact in the environment around this device that's listening to you, the better off they are to service you. To, to, to make money off you. So, you know, that's that you know, everybody has to go into it with that sort of understanding. And as long as you're good with that, you know, and you, you're you not worried, you're, you're kind of the, men, of the mentality, hey, I got nothing to hide, whatever. I'm just, what am I going to say in front of this thing that, you know what I mean? Um, unless you're planning to murder somebody, right? <laughs> you shouldn't worry yeah. about it. But, and that was one uh, of the, the comments to our article, too. Um, Bruce McDonald, I don't know if you're listening, but I'm going to read his comment. He said, anyone listening on my Google Home device is going to be bored. And I think that's probably how most people uh, feel about smart right. speakers and, and the privacy right. issue. Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, the flip side of that is, you know, who knows? I mean, where 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 do you draw that line on privacy at the expense of service? And, and I don't know. Marco, what are your thoughts on this whole debate? Um, I'm with Paul. I, I have an Alexa. I have a, an Echo, and I love it. But I, I have two things I just want to share. I know we're running out of time, but one of them's funny, and one of them's kind of freaky. So there's this funny meme that's going around where it's like people in the '60s were worried that the government was going to wiretap their home, and then people now are like, "Hey, wiretap! Can cats eat pancakes?" You know, and they're talking <laughs> to their, their Echo. I just think that's so funny. But now this this is serious and I swear this is true. This just happened two days ago in my house. I'm sitting on the couch talking to my wife. She pulls out her phone to show me a bed set, a comforter to see if I liked it because she wanted, she had some gift cards and she wanted to order a particular set of uh, you know comforters and sheets for our bed. Not five minutes later, I'm playing words with friends on my phone I finish a move, I get an ad for the exact set at the store she showed me, two different devices, 
And wow. I mean, we're obviously being tracked. I don't know if it was because of our proximity or it was because something in our voices was recorded during that conversation. But I swear to God, that's true. Five minutes later, I got an ad for what my wife showed me on her phone earlier. It was it was kind of freaky. So yeah, I mean, there are privacy concerns. These things are recording. There's always something to worry about whether it be software, a nefarious person running one of the servers, hackers, whatever, um, I think people will give up some of that privacy for the convenience these things offer. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I agree. I think that's the majority of most folks. I think if you're if you're of the type that has the mindset that you know my privacy is the last bastion, and God damn it, I'm keeping the government and corporations out of my shorts. Fine. I mean, that, if that's your prerogative, I think there's a lot of folks that will take the convenience of these devices. And, you know, but I think it I think it's a healthy paranoia too, to, you know, take your device, understand the hooks, the you know, what it's sending upstream to to, you know, the mothership and just understand, be educated about what you have in your home, what it can do, how it interacts with the service provider. And, you know, don't don't you know, just pull the wool over your eyes and think, oh, I'm going to be okay. I don't, you know, I don't do anything illegal, so I'm not worried about my privacy. But, you know, you know it, it always makes sense to be informed. And that's kind of what we're here for, you know, and what other folks, you know, in the tech press are here for is to help educate you with that. So, you know, read it up, learn it, understand what you got in your, in your, in your home. And as long as you're good with it, yeah, don't sweat it for now. It's, it's an amazing new world of contextually aware computing. And uh, I think it's cool too. You know, all right, let's let's move on. We got to keep a good clip here and uh, finish up with a couple of things. Um, you should swing by the site when you get a chance. We just posted up our Microsoft Surface laptop review uh, and we had our, our editor Tuan take a look at that um, Microsoft Surface laptop. It is a very well appointed premium device with a very unique design signature. That's, you know, sort of a Microsoft, um, you know, uh, you know, just you know, only only Microsoft can can pull together that that look and feel that it has today in the Surface. That's you know Surface specialty. Um, so very well built, premium feel and look and and um, experience with the device. A um, couple of caveats, certainly you know when it came out back in May, this was pre Intel eighth generation uh, CPUs, and so now there are more powerful configurations in the market for other laptops with Intel eighth gen that are competitive at the same price point, offering a little bit more performance. And also Microsoft's choice of SSD, we felt in this in this build wasn't perhaps as robust as it could have been, but um, you know, it is it is a good machine with solid performance, Intel KB Link, seventh gen dual core on board. Um, you know, for the mainstream consumer, I think um, you're, you're probably not gonna miss that, that uh, that eighth gen quad core setup that is available in some notebooks today on the market. Now that Intel has rolled that out. Um, and, um, you know, if you're not a power user that perhaps those two cores, you're, you're not going to miss them. After all, we've been, you know, on ultra books for, for years now with, with dual cores. Um, but, um, you know, it's, it's definitely something to consider. And if you like that, that design, the, the, um, the build quality, the keyboard area, um, the material that it's built with, you know, the, the build quality and materials and workmanship of that machine, it's definitely something to consider. Marco, any thoughts on this premium uh, uh, Surface laptop? Um, yeah, I mean, I think you kind of nailed all the salient points. I, I believe the most important point to consider is what we were just talking about with the processors. Um, typical Microsoft premium build with some unique aesthetic features, but because of the timing and Microsoft sort of, they're, they're a bit conservative with the hardware platforms that they choose. Um, yeah. For the money, you can get much more computer today. I mean, it was a different story when it launched a few months ago, but today, if you're shopping for a powerful notebook, um, there are less expensive options that offer more performance, just not quite the same um, not that they're lesser build quality, not the same type of build as the Surface laptop. Right. What's the material around the keyboard? Uh, a lacquer? What's it called? I'm forgetting it. Uh, what the heck is it called? Starts with an A. I can tell you in two <laughs> seconds. No, it's really Alacra, so. It's kind of call it. around, around the. Um, if you haven't seen the Surface laptop, around the palm rest and around the keyboard, around the touchpad area, it's actually a cloth. It's Alcant Alcantara. Alcantara. 
Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, Alcantara. It's like a suede-like material. It, it's, you know, some people are concerned it's going to get dirty. Um, it's going to get kind of funky because it, it is a fabric. But this stuff's used in cars and high-end automobiles. It should hold up pretty well. Yeah, you might have to clean it up a bit, but it should be okay. Yeah, yeah. Cool looking device. Check it out. Check out our review at Hot Hide where you can see all the numbers and how it um, maps into the current landscape of product out there. Um, beautiful display, three by two format. So a little bit different versus 16 by nine. Um, but um, interesting device for sure. Definitely premium and definitely worth a consideration if you're looking at Ultrabooks these days. Another device that I think is worth your consideration before we wrap up with details of our giveaway. So stay tuned for that. Another device is the LG V30. I'll mention this real quickly. LG V30 is getting the Android 8 Oreo update. Uh, we just got word uh, over the wire this week. We published a little article on that. This is one of my favorite Android phones ever. Um, I'm running it currently as my daily driver. Great device, um, beautiful display, OLED display. Um, the, the screen to bezel ratio is super thin, so it's an 18 by nine format display. And it is just, um, you know, again, just one of my favorite phones. Um, Android phones in the market, Snapdragon 835, super fast, four gig of RAM, um, and, and good stuff. Great camera as well. I, I've took a bunch of photos over the holiday with family and friends and just super good low light performance. Android 8 Oreo coming to the LG V30 um, soon. Um, there, I guess they're going rolling out um, beta trials now. So uh, good stuff there and glad to see LG bringing that next generation OS. Keep it coming. Um, so Marco, let's wrap this baby up with some discussion on our Lenovo holiday, hot holiday giveaway. We got some cool prizes for good girls and boys, right? We sure do. We finally have the official details and we went ahead and launched right after Christmas. We're going to run it for about three weeks. Um, our friends at Lenovo have hooked us up with some really cool hardware. So three prizes that we're giving away. Uh, first place is a gorgeous uh, Lenovo Yoga 920 14 inch Ultrabook. This is based on Intel 8th gen Core i7 processor touchscreen, eight gigs of RAM, 512 gig uh, SSD. So super <laughs> premium device. Then the second place winner, we have a, a Lenovo Legion Y720, Y720 Cube gaming PC. So Core i5 in this guy with eight gigs of RAM, um, a one terabyte hard drive and a Radeon RX 480. And the third place prize is the very cool uh, Star Wars Jedi Challenges AR kit we talked about on the previous podcast. Uh, this kit links with a bunch of popular phones and you can play some Star Wars themed games in uh, AR, which includes this really cool lightsaber. Super awesome kit and it could not be any easier to win. Come by the site, um, like a couple of Facebook pages and just make some friends conversing on the site. No spammy crappy posts converse on the site, contribute to the news and article uh, conversations. And those are your entries. Could not be any easier. Nice. Yeah. The Yoga 920, by the way, we have in the review process right now. Uh, that is a really nice looking machine. Um, and it is yoga eyes. So that 360 degree uh, full pivot hinge. Uh, the Legion Y70, uh, Y720 Cube is, is a really cool machine. Very compact, little small form factor gaming PC. And uh, yeah, of course, the AR kit, the, the Jedi Challenges, we actually reviewed that recently. So swing on by if you want to check that out. Uh, works with a, a, a bunch of different phones. If you have iPhones, several generations of iPhones, several generation of Galaxy devices, as well as I think Moto and Pixel devices. So check out the compatibility list there. We're giving it all away. Stop by hothardware.com where you can find us on the web, twitter.com slash hothardware, facebook.com slash hothardware, youtube.com where you hopefully are going to subscribe and like, please, because we like you and we'd like you to subscribe. Yeah. And uh, facebook.com, uh, uh, hot hardware and uh, youtube.com, excuse me, um, hot hardware vids is our channel where you're hopefully watching us right now. Wow. I think we squeezed that all in. Paul. What else should we do? Oh, we I, I think you got it all. All that's left is to wish everyone a happy new year. We'll we'll catch you guys again in 2019. Yeah, stay tuned for our CES 2018 coverage as well, folks. Uh, coming real soon. But um, thanks very much for stopping by. We'll catch you in the next one.